That's interesting. What led you to the eight year of I'm finding myself? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on my abstinence journey. What yeah. was the catalyst for that? I believe that this gentleman who was a pastor was my husband and he was not. Let me just go ahead and put that out. <laughs> you thought he was and he wasn't. I thought he was my husband. I believe God. I was in the word. I was manipulating God's word to fit my my own agenda. I mean, you could not tell me. That he was not, but he 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 wasn't. So what 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 the initial inception of that idea? How did that occur, dear future wifey? Okay, scripturally, the Bible says your father has already designed and purposed you. I experienced an invitation of God this morning. So you got to become an elite decision maker. Elite decision maker. He said because you are one fleshly decision away from losing it all. Etched in my mind is what true submission to Christ looks like. I got to maintain that secret connection I have with God. I'm so full and don't want to belabor this letter. And, and I understand how important it is for men to disciple men, because if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be where I am today. I've, I've traded uh, worldly pleasures to live a God-centered life. The encounter I just had, I just need to rest in it. Help us to be considerate, creative, and courageous lovers. I love you. Your future hubby. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Latera R. Whitfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, can we get a commitment? Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. And while you're at it, I want you to visit the description and sign up for our mailing list. We have some exciting things coming up and I want you to hear about it before the world hears about it. As a matter of fact, um, next month we'll be launching our program, Identifying You. Make sure you go to identifyingyou.com. That link is in the description so we can uh, talk about these things that's going on in these relationship streets so that you can identify you so you can find him. Find the person that God has designed for you by dating strictly by core values. It's an amazing program. Uh, make sure you go visit the website. Well, today I have a good buddy of mine. So I met this queen about three years ago when I was able to take part in her program. She has this amazing platform called Ministry, And so uh, we did this live taping of Ministry in Atlanta um, at the gathering spot. And it was so, so much fun. Um, I, I love this woman. She's a amazing thought leader. She's transparent and vulnerable. So without further ado, welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast, my home, Chanel Scott. What's up, Chanel? What's up? What's up? Were well, you here now? I you, am here. You here now. See, I'm a future wifey. Yeah, you're a future wifey. So the reality is this, you know, I know, uh, I know you've been wanting to come on the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes people feel like, different seasons like even when I do live some people be like well why didn't you call me to do a live you're in my city or whatnot I choose people specifically for um, I call it the cast like my background is a director mm -hmm. and so when I will put plays together I will pick specific people to that I believe would be a great ensemble and so you're one of those people that I need to talk to personally Okay. I want I wanted you on here so we can talk not on the panel but just me and you oh, and wow. chop it up because you're an amazing host and now you're on the other seat. Yes, yeah. I am. So <laughs> Chanel, <laughs> Chanel, Chanel, Chanel. So um, you said something interesting. We had a conversation mm -hmm. uh, recently, and you said that once you turned fifty, mm -hmm. you felt a shift, yes. and you just celebrated your fiftieth birthday back in May. Yes. What shift did you feel? Wow, just certain things that I'm just not going to tolerate. Mm. Just in terms of how I navigate relationships, how I move in life, my relationships, whether it's romantic, whether it's platonic, just certain behaviors just not going to be tolerated. 
Do you feel like in the dating market because uh, you've never been married before? No. Have you ever been engaged? No. Never been married, never been engaged. You have any kids? No kids. And so you're the woman that I get a lot of DMs about. <laughs> I have women that say that, you know, they're in their 50s, uh, pushing towards 60, no kids, never been married, never been proposed to. Mm-hmm. And they've grown a little hopeless in these dating streets. Mm-hmm. Where do you feel like you are at? You know what? I'm actually content in my singleness. I do desire to be in a relationship, but I do want it to be the right relationship. I mean, I didn't get to be 50 to settle. Of course. Right? Um, one of my biggest fears is settling for the wrong person and then walking into a room where you see Mr. Potential and you're like, dang. <laughs> <laughs> If I had just waited, waited one more day, one more day, <laughs> then I could be with, you yeah. know, who I want to be with. So I'm willing to wait. Do you feel like um, he's out there? I absolutely believe he's out there. Let me ask you this. The, your dating age. Yes. You're 50. So mm-hmm. how young will you date? And then how old would you date? I like younger men. What age? Uh, I would say 10 years. So from from 40 uh, to what? How to 50. Old? 40 to 50? <laughs> <laughs> Chanel, come on. You said he can't be no older than you? It just depends because, you know, I don't want, I don't want someone running on my parade. I'm still very youthful. <laughs> I so like to like have a good 50, time. 51, he going to rain on your parade? You know, my mama, she be telling me about even 40-year-olds, you know, like they impotent. So I, I have some... <laughs> <laughs> so concerned because I don't know. <laughs> well, well, you can ask. You can find that out. But are they going to tell me the truth? Well, I mean, if you if you don't notice the difference, then that means it ain't that important. If he taking the medication or whatnot, and 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 it's okay. not impeding on that's y'all good. sex life, then it's then it's fine. That's good because you like you just right. He, he fifty one. You said never mind. I just have okay so. A little bit about me. I spent eight years, right, not dating, no dating, celibate. That was the first thing. And what age? What, how that was from age 33 to 41. Wow. And so it was almost like my life stopped, like I stopped living. So at age 41, when I picked back up, it was like I was still 33 because I had all that time. So I'm a little bit behind in terms of time, mindset. I feel, I believe that in my heart. And so that's another reason why I don't think I'm ready to date a 51, 52, 53 year old. I just don't think I'm, they would probably think I'm immature for sure. Really? Yeah. You believe that? Or they may be, I don't know. I just, I'm just a different type of, I'm, I'm, Explain, I'm, what's so different about you? Like, and I'm, I'm basing this off of people that I know in that age group. Okay. I still like to have, I still like, well, maybe 50, 50 year olds like to wear J's. I still like to wear J's. Mm-hmm. I'm just, you know, I like to have fun. I'm, I'm What does youthful. fun look like for you? Like, now, okay, I'll take that back because I'm a little boring. <laughs> That's well, what I'm I like, saying. You start unpacking. I take that back because I think I like to. I like to travel. Okay. Um, we talked about this. I like to spend money on expensive toys to kind of pacify the whole idea of being single. I have to have something that's going to excite me. Yes. Right. So and, I'll go, and the toys you done bought you. You done bought you. Uh, I bought a 2024 um, M4 competition BMW, which is a freaking sports car. It's a sports car. I got the 2023 G wagon. I bought that new. You know, just. And you said, which I love, you said, (laughs) I've been buying all this stuff and I'm not content. It doesn't make me happy. It's not another thing I can buy to bring me happiness. Absolutely. It doesn't give me the excitement that I'm looking for over time. Obviously, I do get a thrill when you first get Mm -hmm. it. It's exciting. But just like anything, it wears off. You get used to it. You get accustomed to it. A lot of times, I don't even realize I'm driving what I'm driving until the person next to me is looking like, that's a nice car. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm like, oh, "Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, I forgot. (laughs) <laughs> so aside from that no I don't get it but I have really found contentment because God has shown me like especially those relationships where I'm like gosh why didn't you allow it to work he's a, he's shown me why so I'm like God I get it now I get it now and I'm willing to wait on you because if I if you had allowed me to have that back then it wouldn't have worked out it probably would have ended up in divorce and so I'm cool me and God we cool today I can't always say we've been cool <laughs> but we cool today <laughs> i saw a video where you were remodeling your house mm-hmm. and it was absolutely 
stunning. Thank you. When you're doing stuff like that, mm -hmm. doesn't that, because for me, when I'm remodeling my house or doing stuff like that, it makes me be like, gosh, I wish I had my, yeah. my wife here. Do yeah. you have that same feeling? I absolutely do. Most times when I'm doing the accent walls and doing remo serious remodeling, I've just come off of a show. Okay. So I'm on this high. And most times, you know, when you go home, you have someone, to, if you're in a relationship, you have someone who can pour into you and you pour into when y'all talk about it. I don't have that. Yep. So I put that energy into the core. The core. <laughs> <laughs> Doing it's like the, the bigness of it. You know, so, so you, so you, re, how often do you remodel your house? Well, it's a new house. I just had it built in 2022, so I'm still. So how did that feel? See, when you're building a house, yes. that's another moment. You're like, I'm building this house mm -hmm. for me. Yes. How many bedrooms is it? It's only three bedrooms, but, but it's only one you. Yeah, it's only one me. I turned one bedroom into a, a custom closet. A whole bedroom. A whole bedroom. <laughs> California closets came in and transformed it. <laughs> You took the yeah, whole the whole is, bedroom. Is, is the closet full? Yes, yeah, full. So you've been buying that much stuff. Yeah, I have a stylist. Look, look. I mean, I'm not gonna stop living just because I'm. You know, I gotta live. I gotta enjoy this <laughs> while I can. And I, you have to have something to take the edge off. Yeah. I'm just being real with yeah. you. You know, someone like me who is 50, never married, never married, yeah. no children. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, you yeah. already know what the dating climate is like. Yeah. So I don't kind of. I don't play in those streets like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play in those streets like that. So I got to do something to take the edge off. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Are you, is your desire abstinence until you get married? You know what? I don't, I have been abstinent now for the last four years. Aside from the eight, that was a whole, that was another stint. Yeah. Um, I don't desire abstinence. So you was abstinent for eight years and you fell off for how many years and then got back for four years? Yeah. But how many years How many years that? did I fall off? Um, I fell off. So from 41 to what, four years ago was 46. So oh, for five years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then that was like sporadic. But and I don't even claim abstinent now. It's just that I'm not dating because you're just ab you're just abstinent by default. Is that what by you're default. To <laughs> like I love God and I want to do it his way. But at 50 years, it should never be a but when you put God in the sentence. But at 50, we've lived more years than we have ahead of us. Right. Some of us. I mean, yeah. let's God allow me to you see 100. 100. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm just like, God, can you extend me some grace yeah. now? But I am more disciplined in my decisions. Yeah. You know, I'm not just going to go out there and be wild, which is why I'm not, you know, it's been I'm four years. Now. Yeah, yeah, it's been, yeah, but I mean, I just haven't met the right person. That's interesting. What led you to the eight year of, <laughs> I'm finding myself, I'm, I'm, I'm on my abstinence journey. What yeah. was the catalyst for that? I believe that this gentleman who was a pastor was my husband and he was not. Let me just go ahead and put that out. <laughs> you thought he was and he wasn't. I thought he was my husband. I believe God. I was in the word. I was manipulating God's word to fit my, my own agenda. I mean, you could not tell me that he was not, but he, he, he wasn't. So what, what, what the initial inception of that idea, how did that occur? So uh, he came to my church. I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time, and he did a revival at my church. He was a single man. His wife had passed maybe two or three years before she had pancreatic cancer. And so I was familiar with him because he was an amazing um, orator. Like, so I was looking forward to it, you know, and, but that wasn't on my mind. I mean, I'm just looking forward to, cause I love, I'm a lover of the word, but I had a strong desire for relationship. You know, I'm in my early thirties. Mm -hmm. At that time I had achieved a certain level of success. Even then, you know, in I, corporate America during that time. Right? Yeah, I was in corporate America. And back then, cause I, this, I'm on my second life, by the mm -hmm. way, back then I had, um, had bought my condo Nice car You know Because there are Different levels to success yep. Obviously And so Went to church And he was a Guest speaker At our church And I don't know I, I was attracted We talked about I was attracted To the anointing On him But it didn't help That after the service He he had a little You know Flirtatiousness In him And I picked up on it And so I made the decision To visit his church and um, visit the church, and we spent. You lived in Atlanta. I and, lived in Atlanta, and, and he and the, and the he, church was in Charlotte, Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville. And um, a friend of mine, a young lady who attended church with me, she and I went to Nashville 
to meet this man. I'm just I'm I'm as real as yeah. as real as it's gonna be. Talk. Um, what happened was um, I sent an email to the assistant, uh, just letting them know we were going to come. I did not get a response. And we let them know when we were going to come, which was supposed to be not that weekend coming up, but the following weekend. But then we had some things that we had to do at our church. So we said, you know what? We're going to go this weekend. And we hopped in the car. We booked a hotel. And we went to Nashville. We went to the church. It was an amazing time. After the church service ended, we went down to the front because that during this time, because this was years ago, during this, this was in 2007. During this time, um, people were still standing at the front of the church shaking hands. They yeah. don't do that no more no. today. But um, we went down and we ran into the assistant first. Now, mind you, I never met the assistant. This was I, I saw him, but I never met him. So when we went down and ran into him, he was like, Hey, I thought y'all was coming next weekend. So he knew. Oh, so he saw the email. He knew who I was. He saw the email and he knew who I was. Like I'd never met him and he knew. So they must have been talking because I told you there was some flirtatiousness. <laughs> and so I, we explained why we came that Sunday and then we went to the pastor and he, you know, he made a joke about us playing hooky from our church, you know, and it was just, you know, yeah. real small talk. And then that, that was the end of it. And so we in the parking lot. This is a mega church. So we waiting cars everywhere and I'm just outdone because I'm like oh my god we drove six hours for that <laughs> like what in the world you get a handshake yeah and then right as I'm going on and on I get a call from a private number and it was him and he asked us you know he uh he basically asked, which, you know, I thought you guys were coming next weekend. And um, as he said, y'all must have checked out of your, your hotel already. And of course, I said, yes, we have. He said, well, I'd like to catch up with you guys, but I'm going to go to dinner first. Like, I guess the church at that time was preparing a meal for him. He had lost his wife. So they were, you know, taking mm-hmm. care of him. And so we was like, cool. And so we went and we got dinner. And while we were waiting for him to reach back out, we changed our clothes and he called. And the first thing he said is now, listen, he was like, you know, I know I don't want to say his name. I can't say his no, name. Can't I can't say his name. name. But he was like, but what he, he used his name in what I'm about to say. Yeah. He was like, I hope y'all not. Y'all didn't come here for Todd. Just say Todd. Todd revelations. Because, yeah. you know, he's he's a. He's amazing pastor. And I'm like, I didn't even know what he was talking about. I wasn't familiar with what he meant. And so I'm like, no, we just came, you know, just to check, you know, come to church, trying to play it smooth, not trying to be too overly aggressive or too forthcoming. And so um, prior to, I got to go back, prior to him calling, right, me and my girlfriend, we're having this conversation. She was like, so where are we going to meet at? I said, girl, I don't know. She said, I know he ain't going to invite us to his house. I said, I don't know. Probably not. I don't know where we're, he'll tell us because he lives here. When he called, he was like, this is my address. I said, girl, he invited us to his house now. And so we went. Um, he said he liked to have, you know, he relaxes on Sundays after church. And so I'm like, OK, that's cool. We just can't. We, we just gonna hang out. No problem. We get to the house. He lives in a big, beautiful home. And when he steps out the front door, he has on a shirt. In shorts That was the first thing I was like Oh god Where the suit at I thought that was the bishop You know you know, I thought I they was, wear suits everywhere Yeah I thought you they know, sleep in suits I, I just wasn't used to it You know I, I saw him in a certain light yeah. So he was himself Which yeah. I appreciated Yeah And um, he allowed us To come into his home And we played Truth or Dare we played cards and the games were kind of structured where he could really, I know he was curious know, yeah, about what we were yeah. doing there. Yeah. And so with the whole truth to dare, that's how he got to the root of it. You know, like <laughs> what was that question? And what did you reveal? <laughs> like, you know, he was like, so tell me what, what made you guys come down here? And we look at my eyes, biggest quarters. <laughs> Cause I don't want to tell this man. I believe God told me you were my husband. <laughs> Crazy, but I ain't that crazy. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes these women be too too aggressive. You know, and I'm still struggling with it, but I believe this. Yeah. You know, yeah. at this point, I didn't have a word to go along with it, but I believed it in my heart. And I'll I'll tell you, like, because I want people to who 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 have had these similar experiences. A lot of times when you in leadership in church, women are attracted to the anointing on your life, but they don't even understand it. Yeah. And so 
I'm still trying to figure it out, but I believe it in my heart. And so he was like, that's what's up. He trying to be all hip and cool and whatever. Oh, you said it? No, no. I said I was, I had interest and I wanted to come in. Oh, you said you. interest. So you yeah, said I ain't say, no, I ain't say that husband stuff. So yeah. I, you I, said, didn't say you that. Said I have interest. I had interest in meeting you. And so we decided to come is what I said. I did not say, I believe you, my husband. He probably would have put us out. Right then. And I remember him saying when we decided to spend the night, I was like, well, I'm hungry if we stay in. And so he and I, we left my friend behind. He and I went to the kitchen. So we're talking and I just remember him saying, you know, this is not like a defining moment or anything. And that's how he saw it. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm thinking this is purposeful. <laughs> this is defining. Moment. I'm like, he must don't know, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> He must don't know. He a little slow, Jesus. He a little slow. <laughs> but I was afraid now. I was nervous. Like, because I mean, I was young. I was 33 years old when this happened. I'm 50. I was like, I respected him and who he was, you know. And at that time, I really desired a husband. Like, it was an unhealthy desire because I had accomplished everything that there was to, to accomplish at that age. Mm -hmm. And so we spend the night. And uh, the next day, I mean, he was still cool. He was like, well, he he played he played basketball back then, like in the morning times. I never forget. He was like, y'all can stay. I'll be back, you know. But I guess he had like a standing appointment. I don't know. And so we was like, no, we got to go back because my girlfriend, she had a 15-year-old at the time. And she had to get back to her daughter. And after that, we talked on the phone a couple times, not many we times. We said spend the night. You can't just slide by her. <laughs> so so who, where, where'd you sleep? Where where'd your body lay down? We at? shared the bed. Who is we? The pastor. Oh, okay. Because I want to see if you shared the bed with your homegirl, or did you share the bed with the pastor? I shared the bed with the pastor, but he didn't. He wasn't inappropriate. Okay. He was not inappropriate. It was more like a a slumber party. <laughs> like a slumber party <laughs> I think for him I do remember um, so when we spent we decided to spend the night this is in this is in May when this happened so it was hot I was like I need to take a shower took a shower and I think in that moment and then he didn't come in but he came in after I got out and I had the towel I'm cleaning I never forget I cleaned my face with some proactive back then I was still I still had the pimple thing going on <laughs> And I think in that moment, I just noticed like he put, I think in that in that moment, he checked himself like, let me get out of here. <laughs> well, I that. never forget because when, when I went to I went to walk towards him, he was like, oh, and I was just walking towards him like I wasn't because. But you had a towel right there. I had a towel. And when he saw me getting ready to walk, <laughs> what you doing? <laughs> <laughs> now I had not hit my cup. Uh, okay. So so you said you you walked, you had a towel on, water yeah. dripping all off of you, and then and, he, when, and you yeah. just walked to him. What were you about to say to him? I can't remember. What you walking up on him for? You know, I think while he was there, so during so Lord, they gonna kill me, Jesus. Now I wrote about this in a book, so a lot of this is there, but this PD, you getting the exclusive because I never spoke on this. I ain't get the intricate details. But during the the game of truth or dare, he dared me to kiss him. I was about to ask you, Josh. Yeah, to kiss. I kissed him during the game. And your friend looking like, ooh. Yeah, it was crazy. So he had lip gloss on his mouth. Or he's going to go wipe it off. Yeah, and I said, you got glitter because it was glitter in the lip gloss. <laughs> and that's why I was, I said, you got glitter on your mouth. And when I went to approach him, he was like, uh-uh, and he went back out. And I think in that moment, you know, he had to go, you know, I guess, cool himself off. I don't know. So, <laughs> so, so I don't know. But, but in hindsight, he was just having a good time, yeah. you know. And so after that, I so mean, so y'all, 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 you get in the bed, you sleep, y'all, mm -hmm. y'all cuddling, spooning, none of what no. y'all doing, mm -mm. and then y'all just woke up and he was gone to do. do he say, "I'm gonna go play basketball. Y'all can stay." We chose to leave. After that, he would send me like little, you know how they send little encouraging text messages, and like we talk a couple times. And I mean, at the time, but from what I remember, he was a single man back then. And you know how when you, ever you have these high moments, you want to call and tell someone. Yeah. I never forget one time he did a. Some a show that is down in Nashville. I can't remember the name of the show. It was a show that used to air. But anyway, he called me to talk about it. He was so excited. And back then, I just 
I couldn't, I was too intimidated to have an intelligent conversation with this man. So, and I, and he picked that up, you know, and then I guess he decided in himself that this isn't my person. And so we maybe talk once or twice more and then he just kind of fell back. And I respected that. I wasn't like an aggressive Delulu, but it was <laughs> in my heart that this man was my husband. So I started following the 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 online broadcast at Streaming Faith back in the day. Mm-hmm. I used to tune in mm-hmm. and I believe this with all of my heart. And as I began listening to the word, like you couldn't tell me that God was not directing me there. Yeah. And maybe about this was in May. In October of that same year, I ended up moving to Nashville, Tennessee. I moved to Nashville, So a Tennessee. few months later, about six months, months later, later yeah, about five months, months later. later. Mm-hmm. I moved there and I joined the church. Did you tell him you was coming? No. You just popped up. When I got there, I didn't call him at all. I went to church and I called him at the church. That was the first time after that service. And he, you know, we talked and he asked me, he said, well, you know, what are you doing here? I said, well, I moved here. And he asked me, what were you going to do? He said, what you going to do for work? I said, you know, it's well, here. I'm going to be a first lady. What you mean? What I'm going to do for work? <laughs> like, I didn't believe it was going to be like that. I, be- I believe that God would do it. I believe that there would be a process tied to it. I didn't think it was going to just be like, he just come one day and be like, Boom, whatever. So but you I, didn't have a job when you went there? I did not have a job. Really? No, I did not. You quit your job? I, I, no, actually, I got fired from my job was, in North Carolina. Okay. And, that, and that's the, that was the thing. I got fired from my job. And it was the weirdest thing when I got fired from the job. My cousin called me on my way into the job. And she said, you know, I just wanted to say whatever's about to happen this morning, I want you to know that God has you covered. And I'm like, girl, what you talking about? I didn't know. I wasn't fired at the time. And I promise you, when I got into that office, I wasn't there an hour and they called me in the office. She called me on my way to Your cousin work. Set you up to get fired, not saying. No, she just she, I guess <laughs> like in her I, prayer time. That is crazy. That's crazy. And so so now when they call me in the office, they had made a decision, but they had changed some policies that we're okay at one point, but they was like, you know, we're changing it. And if you do it again, you're going to get the first final written warning yeah. and then fired. So when they're deciding, they didn't fire me right away. They had to talk through it. But I went outside. I'm like, girl, what did God tell you? Because they just called me in the office and this is what's happening. And this is what I'm looking at. And then she got scared. <laughs> so anyway, they the, the office allowed me to finish my day. They didn't walk me out like I had seen them walk other people and embarrass them. And the lady said to me, because I did an exit interview, even though they fired me, I, I had an exit interview. She said, I hear you're moving to Nashville because all of these months I had been talking about God is leading me to Nashville. Now, I didn't really know in real life that was going to happen. But I just because I told you I've been watching the church on streaming faith. I have been tuned in. And when that happened, I'm like, well, God, what am I going to do? And so I'm like, I'm really moving to Nashville. So I really found me an apartment online. I never went down there, found me an apartment online. This is the crazy thing because it leads to everything that I'm doing now. Found me an apartment online, never saw it. Um, I didn't have the money to make the move at the time. I'm telling my sister and I had already got the apartment, told the people I'm coming and didn't have the money. I'm so a, so, so what, what was the, what was the time span? Like you got two fired. weeks. So two weeks, two later. weeks, it was two weeks. And I'm telling my sister as I'm checking my mailbox, I found me an apartment in Nashville, but I don't have the money. I'm telling, I said, but I'm, I'm believing God. He's sending me to Nashville. I go to my mailbox. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. It was what I would need it. Check. I had got a refund check from my school. I was getting my master's at the time. Got the refund check. It was what I needed to go to Nashville. That's why you start feeling like it was God. I get because everything. Yep. And so even when I got to Nashville, I used to work for Bell South A. It's now AT and T. Yep. They called me back for my old role, but I was like, I'm not even in North Carolina. I'm in Nashville. They had one in Nashville. They gave me my job back. I never even had an interview. All I had to do was a drug test. Brought me back in at my same rate of pay and everything. So when I walked in, those people didn't even know who I was. So all of these things happen. So you. So when, how long were you in, um, in Nashville before that job came about? I was only in Nashville. I got the job. I got hired in November. I didn't start until January. 
So I knew I had a job starting in January. So I just, I did like, I, I worked for, look, over the holidays, I did the UPS thing. Yeah. I yeah. did whatever I had to do yeah. to make it happen. Heck yeah. And then when I started back to work, it was on and popping because I was making good money at that company. So I didn't, so I got acquainted with the church. I joined the marketing team because I was in school getting my master's uh, MBA with a concentration in marketing. And I just started being active. I didn't call him. Like, so when we talked on the phone that same day I went to church, yeah. he basically was like, I, I don't fraternize with my members. Like he, he said. Like, he was like, all right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the church again. No, I was just like, <laughs> okay, because I really believe God for it. So I wasn't trying to do it myself. So you really, that wasn't discouraging? It was discouraging, but I believe God. I never was looking for him to do it. Like, I thought that I didn't know how it was going to happen. But you knew it was going to happen. But I knew that I was in place and it was going to happen. So this story is so crazy. So I was there. I didn't I never talked to him anymore. Um, I mean, I talked to him maybe one time, maybe two months after I got there, two months after I got there. And he basically was like very clear on, you know, he he's in a different se- Well, he said I'm in a different season of my life. And, you know, I. He just his circle is small, and he was trying to be nice yeah, and extend you, grace, you, yeah. and and essentially back off. There's no, I mean, for lack of a better word, yeah, he didn't yeah. say that, but, but I mean, I got meant. the picture, and I never called again. And so this was like December of that 2007, 2008. When I never forget, I was I was going to my marketing team meetings weekly, and the people started talking about the pastor had a girlfriend. So I'm listening. And I'm like, what are they talking about? Don't they know? You know, I'm his girlfriend. Don't like they, but they was talking about it. And I would just sit and listen. I never said anything. I would just listen. And lo and behold, he met a woman and they were engaged within two months. And I watched them marry. Did you go to a wedding? No. They wasn't like to the church. It was open to the church. But you couldn't go see that? No, I was in so much pain. I couldn't even stay awake. It was traumatizing. It was, and it wasn't traumatizing because of us it not being so, but all of the changes and adjustments in my life, moving from North Carolina to Nashville. I, I owned my home in North Carolina. Mm. By at that at that point, by that time, I had released my house into a bankruptcy. When I got to Nashville, just trying to pull all the pieces together, I filed a Chapter Seven bankruptcy. You know, they they liquidate everything, yep, and yep. I, I just reaffirmed the debt on my car, and I was free and clear, and I was able to do it in that two month time period where I didn't have a job. I knew I had a job coming in January, that was smart. That's but I did. did it. My attorney let me do it in that little span, yeah. so I got rid of everything. I had a clean slate. Yeah. You know, but then now I'm in Nashville. I don't know anyone. I don't really have any friends. I mean, I have these people at church who I serve with, but I really can't be transparent with them because yeah. I don't want them to be judgy and, you know, isolate me or treat me funny, which eventually it did come out. We'll get there if you want to hear the whole story. Of course I do. Yeah. So. Of course I do. I'm nosing. Yeah. So. I just want you to know that. <laughs> All this is entertaining to me. Yes. Well, well, for two reasons, uh, and I'll just put a little commercial break in here. Mm-hmm. It's because I know that there are women mm-hmm. out there that watch my podcast. They DM me, mm-hmm. and they have imagined mm-hmm. life with me. Then told them they're convinced mm-hmm. that I'm their spouse, and mm-hmm. I haven't even had a conversation with mm-hmm. them before. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I've had a conversation with them and told them, "Hey." Kind of leave me alone. Yes. Like, leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll say stuff not like the pastor told you. I'll say, it ain't, it's very clear. I'll be mm-hmm. like, listen, I'm not your husband. Get that out your head. I think something's wrong with you. Stop doing that. Mm-hmm. That's, that, that, that's weird. Mm-hmm. And then they still don't get it. Mm-hmm. And so, um, then I can understand, at least you had a semblance of a relationship, an encounter with the guy. Yeah. Y'all talked, y'all did that. You He brought you to his house. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, that's very intimate for somebody to bring you to their home. At least that's what it means to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can just imagine for him, based on his uh, notoriety, he just ain't bringing different people at the house. So right. I, I can attest that I would be with you on that thing to, to do that. Um, the moving part, 
I felt like, of course, that's jumping the gun because you just decided, no conversation, you're going to move there. Um, and I understood why, because you say, I'm going to go here for ministry purposes, I'm going to do this or whatever, mm -hmm. because I believe God is going to do this. And I'm not going to orchestrate or force it or try to say, hey, I'm thinking about moving here, trying to get him to weigh in on your decision. You're moving by faith. Right. And that's yeah. where it gets real tricky. It gets real tricky because when I move there, obviously I'm not the only one. I'm new to this. It was so many women that believe that man Are you was hearing them saying that? Yeah, I, I was sit I met a few. I sat next to one lady in the congregation. She was like, God just led me here. And oh, I'm, she moved there too. She came to visit. She didn't move. She came to the church to visit. I worked with another one who moved from Alabama. Said, me and him, we have an assignment together. I said, this some ugly curse. <laughs> <laughs> I met women who believe this thing. I did. So, and while you were hearing them say that, you never put yourself in that same category. I, but you know what? No, because they never had the encounter. So I was hanging my hat on. I met him. I know he attracted to me. If yeah. I, I, at least I got that. Much. And you can at least say we kissed. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, at least one time we did. And I just, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. Like in hindsight, I'm like, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? And what was your cousin telling you? You know what? Me and her wasn't even talking at the time. By now, I don't even know. I can't remember. So when she when you told her when she went and visited the church with you, what did she say? This was the girl. The, that wasn't my cousin. This was just a friend. The cousin that gave me the word about yeah. being fired. She lived in Atlanta. She no, she wasn't the one that went with me. Oh, you wasn't telling her what was going I on. I wasn't telling her what was going on. Oh, okay. And I, it's, I you said that. That's what you should been talking to. I gotta ask her when I get home. Like, girl, what you didn't advise me properly? <laughs> yeah, because now that I think about it, because we're really close to this day. <laughs> So you advised me properly. Yeah, you ain't advised me listened, properly. Though? Probably not. <laughs> no one, no one could, no one could. Let me tell you how deep this thing got. So I joined MIT because I'm a lover of the word. Like I'm a lover. I study. You know, I study. Like I transcribe the word because I real I understand there's a word for the house, but there's a word for me. So I slow it down. To this day, I do this mm. so I can hear the Holy Spirit minister to my spirit. And I was convinced. This is a crazy. Part God was speaking He just wasn't speaking about him I was putting him in the place of my purpose Like I thought I was going to be this leader in church I was going to be doing all these different things And everything that I believed that God was going to do between us He did do in my life It just didn't involve him Teach And I got the exposure that I needed By joining that church And joining that ministry and serving I got everything that I need uh, That I utilize in my my sh I got two shows You know I got two shows mm -hmm. I, Everything that I learned there I implemented That's where Ministry come from The whole platform Cause he He used to do a women's A women's night out And a men's night out With the women and the men And he sometimes would Slide a little bit of himself And talk about how women Were believing that he That he was their husband And I'm like And he would say And he I never forget this one time He said Let me just put a pause in it He says Has anybody Have I Ushered anybody in this church Because it was a room full of women Down to the front of the church Like as if to say If I've never done that Then I don't know why you would think That you are my wife And I want I wanted to get up and say so bad No you didn't But that don't mean that you ain't engaged In behind the scenes What are you talking about And I was like gosh Like you You talking like you ain't had Nothing to do with nobody up in here And you know you did <laughs> If you That's the part that used that. to got me. That would have put me out the church because I it, it ended up coming out. What did the whole situation with me? Because what happened was I never had any problems at church. I was respected, appreciated in that ministry because I wasn't all out. You know what I'm saying? But when he got married, all of a sudden they start getting cautious and. Treating you like he, there was conversations going on behind the scenes. And what happened was I had signed up for MIT, went through their process and got accepted. Ministers in training got accepted. It. So it's called MIT at their church. It's MIT at their church. Okay. And I had become very close with a young lady who is now she's like a uh, minister there, like, you know, over like 
a particular department that they have at the mm-hmm. church. Rihanna, I want you to Google who what church has a program called MIT so we know what this past is. <laughs> now it's playing good. Yeah, it's so crazy. <laughs> so I, t- I shared with her because she was my friend what I believe. Right. Like, I shared with her. Well, she went back and told the person over Christian education at the church what I believed. So the lady over Christian education went to him and was like, hey, we have a person who has been accepted and this is this is what I've been told. You know, do I have permission to go and have a conversation with her? And he gave her permission to have a conversation with me. And we sat and we met. They didn't shun me initially. We sat and we met and she said, Chanel, everything that you sound you say and sound believable except he married. Cause I didn't at that point I was like, I don't care if he married because I know God told me before he even got married and whatever. I did not because I, I just you he felt like he's gonna strong. divorce he's gonna divorce his wife. I was so strong headed. No, I didn't know what was gonna happen, but it didn't it didn't change what I believed. I had no clue. So they told me I could not start MIT. But what they did do was she had me. It's kind of like she kind of took me under her wing. And it says they probably was watching me. I ain't yeah. no fool. I'm not crazy. You know, but I would meet. Cause ain't no fool. You ain't crazy. You know what I'm saying? Um, I would go because I loved I loved the word. I loved it. So it was OK. So I would go and meet with her like they had four services and I would meet with her, her like the first service. And it was more like a mentoring thing. And But I knew it was like more of a watchful eye. Mm-hmm. In a sense And so that's how That piece played out And so After that I left Nashville My lease ended on my apartment Because after that They got married Like I did kind of You know I had my doubts And I didn't like my job anymore And During that time So for this whole season You wasn't dating nobody I didn't date anybody You were saving yourself for him Yeah Because I came there for that purpose I didn't come to I didn't I didn't come to Nashville because I wanted to live in Nashville, Tennessee. I came there for a reason. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So came for my husband. I came for my husband. <laughs> I, and I believed it. So I left for about three months and I realized that I went home though. And I hadn't been home since I graduated, since I graduated high school. And home for you is Atlanta. New, New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey. So okay. I went home and I was like, this this ain't this ain't it. So I went back to Nashville. And this time I went back. I didn't have a place. I had meant this is where it gets crazy. I mentored some young girls, and one of them, she and I, we just really had a close bond. And I was like, and I never had an issue finding a job. So I'm like, I'm gonna come down there. I'm like, can I come crash with you? I'm gonna crash with you for about two weeks, find me a job, get my spot. Cause that's how I, was, I used to be a flight attendant. So I know how to oh, move. You know what I'm saying? Like you, 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 yeah, I know how to move. You bold. You just move around and no no it, fear. I've been, you know, been through life, you know. So when I moved down there, I decided that I wasn't gonna get a job, that I was gonna just serve. So I literally and they gave me some very, they gave me an assignment where I went out into the community because I had the the marketing degree. My by now I finished school. And I literally was their advertising director. And I went to the different businesses and bought had the business owners buy ads for the magazine. And I raised about $30,000 between two editions. Nice. And, but during this time, though, I was living with a college student on TSU's campus with no income, not able to take care of myself at one point. At a certain point in there, my car was repossessed. Mm. Like they called me. I never even got harassed about this car. They just called me one day and was like, it's been seven months. We need to pick up the car. And I found- You ain't made a payment in seven months? Nope. <laughs> you was just driving on faith too, huh? Yep. And my dad, he was like, um, Chanel, why don't you refinance the car? I said, dad, because I called to tell him they was going to repossess the car. I said, I'm not calling you because I really believe this. So I was willing to suffer- for this mm. Like it wasn't like A play thing Like I was going through hell Like I went from Driving a Lexus Looking good Smelling good Dressing good To, to sleeping on looking, college campus and Looking like death Not able to get my hair done It was so bad People at church Like this one gentleman Who He just knew me from church He would walk up Not thinking he wanted To shake my hand He would put money in my hand Secretly 
because he knew something was wrong because my appearance had changed. Because he saw you before. So drastically, right. But I was determined to serve. Like my father at one point said, it's too painful to talk to you because you don't have to go through this. Mm. He said, I don't even want to talk. I can't talk to you. Oh, that's a message. You said my father said, it's too painful for me to talk to you because you don't have Have to to go go through this. this. Think about what our spiritual father says. Think about what God says when he sees us going through certain things unnecessarily. He says, I'm your daddy. Mm -hmm. It's too painful for me to watch you go through this because you don't have to go Go through through this. this. And that's what he told me. And so he would only talk to me when I needed something and I try not to call home. Like we, me and that young lady, she stuck with me and we struggled. She should not have had to go through that. She was in college, undergrad at that. And we, we, I stayed with her for 15 months. The, her, because the church is so big, they're going to know. I don't care. The church is so big in Nashville. It's a very known church that you're going to run into a member. And those people, they don't, she was an RA. The, there was another student that was an RA. They rallied, they made sure I had a place to stay. They'll go and talk. If there was an empty room in an apartment, they were like, they called me, they got my, my God mama going to stay here. She's not going to bother you. And I would go and I would stay and, and set up shop. And I did that for 15 months. And I would take the bus to the church every day, not what every day. And I would serve all day like I worked there. And them people, and they knew something was wrong because I looked I look like something was wrong. They never said, do you need anything? Nothing. Nothing. And at the time, I can say this now, but at the time I wasn't looking for nothing because I was determined to, to make Serve. it. I was determined to do it. I, I wasn't because I knew I chose to be in this situation. So I wasn't looking for any help from anybody. But they never, and then they would ask me to stay late. And I'm like, if you want me to stay late, I'm going to need a ride right, yeah. because the bus going to stop, you know. And then when the one guy, he took me home, I didn't, want, he took me to the college campus. I didn't really want him to take me because then I knew I was going to have to explain yeah, what, what, you what am I doing, a grown woman on this college campus. Yeah. And so at a certain point, the church was going through a transition by now they know because of the MIT. So it's no secret to leadership. But they're not bothering me. But then when my responsibility started to grow, I got called. They told me, Chanel, we want to talk to you. You know, the church is going through a transition. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, they about to offer me a job. Because now, I'm a, by now I've lost my car. I'm taking the bus. I don't have any money. This young lady who is in school, she's taking care of me. Basically, we sharing Roman noodles. There'll be some days she didn't eat or we break it in half. Yeah. Like. It was bad. It was extremely bad. So I go, I get on the bus. I'm like, oh my God, they gonna offer me a job because I've been serving, working. No. The pastor, he had the human resources director call me into an office and ask me about, they wanted to know if I still believed oh, yeah. that he was my husband. And if I had said yes, yep. they were going to relinquish me yep. of my responsibilities. The human resources director what I loved about him, he didn't take a side. He was just in there to hear. And he is the one who told me. Because I, because when he started questioning me about it, I took him all the way back to when I was at the man's house. I said, let me just, if you're going, because I, I never thought you was going to bring me here to ask me about my personal life because that did happen outside the church. It didn't happen in the church. Yeah. Y'all asking me about something that did not happen here. Like me and him have never had any level of engagement mm-hmm. at this church. Mm-hmm. So for him to bring it in the church, let me just go ahead and fill you in because I know he didn't. I know he didn't. And so I let him know. And by the end of that conversation, he was like, I respect you so much. He was like, you know, and I said, you know what? I don't. He was like, I was told, he said, I've been directed to relinquish you of your son. And I told him, I said, no, I don't believe it. And I lied. I lied because I knew. But by then, this is the part. It had been two years. I lived in Nashville for four years. Oh, wow. This wasn't like a couple months. I lived there for four years with this erroneous belief. But I'm thinking by now, it's 2010. Clearly, they ain't, about, they ain't thinking about me because I'm not doing anything. I'm not threatening. I couldn't even, I was in so much pain just watching his wife be elevated and celebrated. Cause you know, they celebrate you when yeah. you come into the church, you know yeah. how it is. Yeah. And so I never forget they like during the time where the, the members greet each other, like at the beginning of the church, she, I was holding somebody's baby. She came up behind me and start playing with the baby. I couldn't understand that. 
I couldn't even face this lady. So you never have to worry about me rolling up on her. I didn't even, I couldn't even stand the sight of her. And I said, why is she, why? And I never spoke to her. I never said anything. So I think that may have been alarming because she may have said, yeah. this person doesn't even talk to me. Yep. She doesn't acknowledge me. I even ran into her at the church office one day while I was working and I walked right by her because I couldn't, I mean, that's a lot. I know it to sit there. And, yeah, it's, you, you know, know my emotions. life literally was, fall- I lost everything. I lost everything. At what point, what happened? What was the, what happened for you to say, I heard wrong. Mm-hmm. I felt wrong. Like you said, this erroneous thought that yeah. you had, mm-hmm. when did that take place? That took place after I had to move back home. So what happened was my uncle, he got married and I went to his wedding and I packed two weeks of clothes to go to Jersey to his wedding. And when I got there, I knew I was not supposed to go back. Why? Because it was the struggle was hard. Like there were times where God, he always showed up for me, but he definitely allowed me to go through. And so you still never had a job. That second stint. No, nope. didn't have a job. I never forget. I'll call myself. I just believe God was going to do something supernatural. I never forget. I moved. I packed up my car. I didn't even tell the young lady because by now me and her are not even in the same room. I moved around several times. At one point we were in the same room and the the person that's over the RA that actually works for the school, they even allowed me to stay there. But then it got to a point where I think someone, another student was complaining about this person and they included the fact that I was staying there. Like that wasn't the problem, yeah, yeah. but they was just trying to throw everything yeah. wrong. Yeah. And so then she said I had to leave. So, but I moved into an apartment with some other young ladies like I said packed up my car no call from nobody like I thought God was packed up your car you got your car again no this before the car got repossessed packed up the car went to the park because I had nowhere to go I didn't want to be a burden on her anymore and I was just hoping that God would show up I was still believing something was going to happen with this man and I was in the park until like 1 30 in the morning and I said I cannot believe I've got myself in this situation. And that young lady called me and she called me, God, mommy, God, God, mommy, what are you doing? I said, I'm in the park. She said, come on back. I go back. And so I stayed with her. Like at this time, the car hadn't been taken. So this was like maybe six months in. When I finally left, my uncle was getting married. I packed up two weeks of clothes. And when I got to Jersey, by this time I had been with her for 15 months. I knew I could not go back. This was in May. I couldn't let her go into another. This was a senior. She was going into a senior year. Right. Couldn't let her go into a senior year dealing with that. So I stayed in Jersey and I ended up staying like, so my, it's crazy. Okay. So let me, let me back up. Stayed in Jersey. I was in Jersey for maybe nine months with my mom. It was very rough because I come from a a long line of strong women. They didn't understand what I was going through. My grandmother, my mother, they were very hard on me. But you never told them that you the the thought about them. Oh, you did. I did. But they. But it wasn't just that. At that point, I think at that point I had a mental breakdown and didn't realize it. Because that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I was like mentally stuck. Like I couldn't. I didn't have the wherewithal to do anything. And so my mother. Oddly enough, God was working in my favor because I don't think I would be alive today if this did not happen. In in Newark, with my mom, my mom rough, she took an early retirement and decided out the blue she's going to move to North Carolina. And just the way I'm saying it, and my my dad is in North Carolina. My dad is from North Carolina. We go to North Carolina because this is where, oh, we go to North Carolina. We go to North Carolina. So she moves to North Carolina. And I went to high school in North Carolina. My dad is from North Carolina. We go to North Carolina, and she grew up there. She 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 not grew up. She grew she grew up there in the summertime. She would go in the summertime and visit aunts and stuff. So she always wanted to go there. So when she took the early retirement, we go down there. Now I'm down there with my dad. I talk to my dad, and I'm like, Dad, I really want you to move in with us because he was in transition just until I can get on my feet. Because Mama is rough on me. Just being here with her by myself, like I just. I felt like I was an abused child and my mama loved me. But when you are in a vulnerable space like that and you can't take care of yourself, you become a child all over again. And that's how she was treating me and I couldn't help myself. So he moved in and eventually we all got moved into a house together. We were all roommates and my father stayed there long enough for me to get on my feet and move to Atlanta. Mm. Six months after I moved out that house, he moved and went his way. Because I asked him, can you stay? Because when I tell you, 
So you had your, your mama and were they married at they one were, point? They were married when they got divorced when I was like three or four. So you done talked your daddy yes. into moving in with his ex-wife. Yes. Because you needed a place to stay and you wanted because to be Because I needed I needed his support. I had a place to stay, but it was like staying with somebody who was abusive. Like she wasn't hitting me, but just the verbal yeah. abuse and not understanding. And your dad loved you that much he to loved come me that much. move in with his yes. ex-wife because his daughter Grown daughter at that. Yes. She 30 at that time. You were 35, 36. Yes. Needed to feel secure and yes. safe. Yes. And he came. Had my mother not made that move to North Carolina and we stayed in Jersey, I'm not sure I would have made it because that's how bad it was. You didn't get no therapy or counseling during nope. that time? All I was in the word. I just, I, that same routine. And that was my anchor because I didn't have nothing else. I had lost everything because when I left Nashville to go to the wedding, remember I told you I took two weeks of clothes. Well, everything else I own, I left with her. Do you know that girl transported my stuff wherever she went for the next four years until I moved to Atlanta and then I drove to Nashville to get my stuff. And by then, I didn't even want it. I took it straight to Goodwill. That's a solid friend. Where is this girl at? You know what? Shout out to you for being a solid friend. <laughs> her name friend. is Jasmine. I will Jasmine, say Jasmine, shout out to you for being a ride or die friend. That's a, that's that's an amazing friend right there. Yeah. Even her mother her mother took issue, which I understand. Yeah. Her daughter's in college and you got this grown woman. Initially, they I used to pick them up and take them to Bible study, take them out to eat and do different things. So that's why I was accepted in the first place. But then it turned, I was no longer a mentor nah, to that young you lady. You became a burden. Yeah, I became a burden for and, sure. And she looked out for you. For She said she just kept transporting your stuff as she was moving. Every time she moved, she would take my stuff with her. I think she probably moved like two or three times. So, yeah, because I left in 2011. I didn't get my stuff until 2015. <laughs> so she, had, I think she had gotten her master's degree by the time I got <laughs> I do. She did. For real. She's like, oh, baby, you done grew all out the stuff that you had. <laughs> yes. And, and and the crazy part is a lot of that stuff was like church suits. I never, I never wear a church suit another day in my life. Never. I used to put on my, I was going to be the first lady. I was sharp. So you had your yeah. St. John suits? <laughs> I did. I did. I was dressing the part because that's how much I believed it. That's what you spent a lot of your money on, huh? On your, on your church suits. Back then, but yeah, that's that's before this life. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about back then. Yeah, I, I did. And so, and so that come to Jesus. When did you get resolved and say, So when I got what, resolved, when did that let me tell you. So I left, I went to the wedding, I told you. Yep. Took two weeks of clothes, decided I wasn't gonna go back. My mama really had to step in and take care of me because I didn't have anything, because I left everything I owned there. I did one more magazine with the church, but we did it we did it over the phone and online. Because I was still serving at the church. This was even after they called me in and because I believed. This time, what what put the nail in the coffin was this last time, there was an issue with the cover of the magazine. We had worked extremely hard and the cover was horrendous. I didn't like it. it didn't represent the work we put into the magazine. So I took it upon myself to email the pastor and say, hey, listen. We're trying to get the cover situated. It doesn't represent the work we put into. I'm asking if you can give us a couple more days to let this person who I knew could design the cover do it. He replied and said, yes, just don't put me in a five-hour crunch. That's what he said. Like, don't make sure it's done so I can have time. So I'm like, cool. That was the gist of the conversation. He went back to the person that's over that ministry mm -hmm. and told him that I reached out to them. He didn't tell him that he gave me permission. So when they call, it's so crazy. I had it was like a spirit of fear just came over me right before the phone rang. So when she called, I didn't answer. So then she left. She emailed me and it essentially was like, you know, we want to speak to you about co contacting the pastor. Like you have to go through the proper protocol. We appreciate your work and everything that you bring, but you know, you didn't go through protocol, and I didn't reply right away. <laughs> By the end of that week, they had locked me out of my email account because I had an email account with the church's domain tied to it. That was the end of my relationship there with the ministry. So why didn't you respond? No, first I, of all, why'd you reach out to him instead of the powers that be that's over you? Because she was overriding. Like she was going okay with the jacked up cover. Okay. 
Right. And some people were not okay, but she was over it. Yeah. So I went over her head. Like other people had issue, but they couldn't yeah, override her. her. But then yeah. why would you ask that? You knew you did something wrong? No, I just I didn't know what she was gonna say because <laughs> I knew he had reached out. So I don't know the type, what picture he's painting of yeah. me. You know, I don't know what he's saying at this point. Because I've already been called in one time for no reason, really. So it was a lot for volunteer positions. Yeah. Because you're going through stuff like you got a for real job. And, you... and they was taking full advantage of the gifts. <laughs> for sure. How but many hours do you think you was working a week? I worked all day. No, I went every day. I went like it was so a real job. So it's a 40-hour job. job. Yeah, I was there all day. 40-hour week job. Yes, I was there with the people who actually was getting paid. So I was assisting them all day. Yes. Yes, I was. The first time around when I did that magazine, I think I raised about $15,000 or so. They gave me a $250 gift card for that. The second time around, they gave me nothing. And I talk about that in my book. That's public knowledge. I put it in my book. So after that, so this is it's so many twists and turns. So after that, I was separated from the church. I'm in Jersey. I'm Me and my mom, we going through it. I'm watching church. It's so crazy because... Because of my marketing skill set there, somebody reached out and was like, hey, we want you to work on a project. Can you come down? We'll pay for your ticket. I'm like, cool. They booked my flight to leave on Monday. I'm watching church on Sunday. They get up and talk about someone was accusing him of spiritual manipulation. This, I'm going to curse again. This was on the news. Like This was on the news. Somebody come forward saying that they had experienced the pastor, you know, they being taken advantage of. And I never believed it. This man, he, he, like, I'm not saying he perfect, you know, I mean, he's a man, but it was around the time when his wife was pregnant with their first child. So, you know how that happened. This woman pregnant. Now, yeah. all the women who believe he was a husband, now they're coming out with craziness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he did this to me, whatever the case may be. And it was a horrible time for them. Like horrible I'll never forget it And I said They don't think I had Because they said There was four more other women Who came forward But they wasn't publicizing Who it was This is on the news Like I went googling When they Because he addressed the church About the allegations So I'm like Oh my god I'm coming this week They gonna think I had something to do with it I had nothing to do with it For the record I had nothing to do with that I was not one of the four women I would never do that Yeah So I go to Nashville And I go to Bible study That Wednesday and I just felt like people was looking at me who had knowledge of the situation because it had only been six months since I had ended my relationship there. But I was just there for Bible study, but I was there working on another project yeah. for someone. And I do believe, I believe this because I had to do, I had to, I suffered through my mistakes, but I also believe that God allowed that too, because I was mishandled for sure, because I wasn't someone who was being inappropriate or doing I, that's just not my style like I really believe this but I believe God to do it I didn't look for him to do anything and anybody would tell you this so in that situation when she knew that he had a child coming was that the straw that broke the camel's back child was born on my birthday child was born on my birthday and on and that's why I know that was only God is the giver of life born on my birthday so I knew the pain of that's what broke the stronghold. Initially, when I found out, I found out a tweet, Twitter, tweet came through on the phone and it was whatever announcing the birth of the child or whatever. It was a morning, it was morning time. And I, you know, how when you, you get shocked initially, there's no response. And I was already getting up, preparing to go out with my grandmother for my birthday because I ain't had no money. She was going to take me shopping. And when I got into that shower, I let out a scream so loud. The pain just hit me so hard. But that was the start of breaking that stronghold. And by now, I moved to Nashville late 2007. This was 2011. No, 2012. This was 2012. Over five years you felt yeah. like that. Two th yeah, five years. So that was the start. And then I ended up getting a job in North Carolina where we were staying Saved up my money. It wasn't even maybe nine months, and I moved to Atlanta. First of all, I want to thank you for sharing that story in detail. It can't be easy to share something like that because especially the way social media works is you'd be like, that girl crazy. Mm -hmm. Who does that? And if we're honest, a lot of times, you know, we believe certain things. Yeah. Uh, I was very transparent um, in a podcast, even from a more simpler state, uh, believing that this particular woman was my wife and, you know, I have to, tell the world that 
you know, she ain't my wife and didn't it didn't it didn't work out, even though we were dating and we were going through counseling and all that. Well, I believe because it's the thing that we can put that's in common with you is that it was signs. It was confirmations. It was I felt like I heard God say exactly what he said. We, we was tracking the confirmations with 26 of them. But it still hadn't materialized as being my wife, yeah. um, and so it's the same thing with you. Um, it's it's and from the basic level of believing that you heard God for something, mm -hmm. and truthfully speaking, even if that was the case, people still have free will. Right. So I can't even say that God didn't say that. All I can say is that you know, even for me or for you, it's just saying that the other person has free will. To decide or not to decide to to walk down the aisle with you, um, and so that's how I like to leave that at people who start believing stuff that the person ain't even having conversation with you, never had a date with you, never you don't even have their phone number, and you believe in that. Mm -hmm. I think you need to take that to God. Uh, please take it to the to the altar, Amen, and take it to your therapist, Amen. Amen. Um, but what would you say? To other women or men mm -hmm. that may be feeling, when you look back and you reverse engineer it, where you say hindsight is twenty twenty. Yeah. what do you see that, and I heard you recalibrate certain things as you were saying it, but mm -hmm. in summation, I want you to say, tell me, what do you think, what would you say to somebody that believes that? God so, is practical. So there was nothing there in terms of he and I. You know, even turn mic. keep talking. They're like, no, don't turn. They're even like, after I got there, over time, because I was there for years, you know, there was nothing practical. Um, God is very strategic as well. So, explain when you say practical. Somebody that's illogical may not even understand what practical means. So, explain what practical. If you a believer, means. first of all, I only believe that you can have authentic relationship with Jesus Christ through His Word, because He is the Word. So I did have the word and he was speaking, but I just manipulated it and made it fit what I wanted to fit. I wanted a husband, but he was saying, before I give you the husband, you need to get in purpose. So I was operating in purpose, exercising those skill sets when I was on the marketing team. He was doing that. He, he strategically, because everything I learned there, yeah, I put it into my business that is successful, yeah. right? I'm sorry. So um, yes, please. So that's the one thing. Get you out of the way. Get what you want out of the way. Get out of your head. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You got to get out of your head. Like me, I wanted what I wanted. And there were moments while I was there where I tried to entertain the idea that I was wrong. But I couldn't because I had lost so much already. That's good. I just couldn't go back. That's good. You know, and then you were fully invested. And yes. You said, I can't cut my losses because that means I probably gave up on God too soon. Mm -hmm. Just like you said at the very beginning and say that if I settle for this and then I see somebody with potential that could potentially be my husband, mm -hmm. then I settle too soon. So I gave up so much. And I know God wouldn't allow me to go give up all this stuff yes. and come from all the way here and go down here without seeing a miracle take place. Yes. Ah, that's good. How do you, when you look back at that situation, have you forgiven yourself from being that long, young 32 year old girl that made that decision? Just this last year. Good. I didn't even realize I hadn't forgiven myself until I was in another situation and I noticed how rigid I was this time because I was like, I can never make that mistake again. And I had to do some self-evaluation. I said, you haven't forgiven yourself. Mm -hmm. That's why you get so aggravated and so irritated, you know? And, I, and, I, and I, I had to forgive myself, but it was very hard. It was very hard to forgive myself for doing that because I'm going to tell you something. People talk about people who commit suicide. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, they're cowards. There's nothing cowardly about that. It crossed my mind several times, but I didn't have the strength. Yep. To do, to do that. Yeah. A person who do that, I don't call them a coward because how? Yep. Because if I could, I would. I didn't have it in me to do. Just looking at my life, living on that campus, living in the dorm, day in and day out, no job, eating Roman noodles, not believing this. I'm in a strange place. I don't even have support of family. Yep. You know what I'm saying? My car getting taken. We, I ate mustard for dinner one time. On what? I just put it on my hand. And I, it sounds comical now, but you couldn't just eat out the spoon. You got to put I it put, in your hand. It was a squeeze bottle. I didn't. You know, you squeeze in your mouth. I didn't do it. 
Were you I dealing just with, did it. Did you have a psychiatric, uh, a psychotic break during that time? That I think I did. I never yeah. got, I never got formally diagnosed, but I think I did because you know how you want something so much, yep. you would drive yourself down yep. trying to get it, and that's what I did because when I finally gave up on it, I had done everything that I could do, everything that was in my, I had came to the end of myself. I had to literally come to the end of myself where there was nothing left because I'm a very determined and persistent person in my nature. If it's if, if it's there to get, I'm getting it. Yep. And that's that's I'm a hustler. So that's why when it was time for me to get back on my feet, it was nothing. I didn't have a hard time getting back. I just had to redirect that energy and focus into something positive. How long did it take you to get back up? It took me. So I moved to Atlanta in 2015 and I started a ministry three months out. Of being in Atlanta And then I I What I I was there Come ministry is, It'll be nine years old In September okay. Nine years old And I gotta just speak on this Cause I lost everything When I got here After working When I got to Atlanta Worked temp jobs I was determined to get a job In my field Which was marketing Couldn't get a job Ended up going into banking I did baking From 2016 And then I worked for Comcast For like a year But I worked a regular Corporate job All the way up to 2021 So from 2016 To 2021 I worked a job God introduced me To a business idea During COVID Me and my sister-in-law I won't get into The details of it but we we launched. She showed me how to do it. I built my. I had to. I had to get my customers online. I went to Facebook. Built. Got built my customer base. You didn't do that. It wasn't. That, it wasn't that blessing tree, was it? It wasn't no, that pyramid. No, no. <laughs> no, I own a software. I own. A, I own a gaming software. Well, you remember what they were doing during COVID? Yeah, they was had, trade money. I ain't they were doing that. all that. Get two hundred dollars. Get two. I said yeah. that is a Ponzi scheme. Y'all over it's here Ponzi lying scheme. to people. Yeah. I said, Lord Jesus. I own a gaming software. So I had, on yeah, that. I own a game and software. She connected me to the distributor. Now the key to being successful, you gotta have players. You can have the software all day long. If you ain't got no players, you ain't making no money. Yeah. I built my group in a month because that's how thirsty I was. When I tell you I had just started a new job at Chase Bank, I was on that job six weeks before I was making seven thousand dollars a week. Then I was like, oh, I'm out. I said, if I can do this and I'm sitting here at the bank, just think about if I put my whole day into it. He was making 7000 a, a week. week. A week. After leaving Chase Bank, I have made $90,000 in a week. That's how God blessed. He was like, here. You want your stuff back? Here. I ain't back. That's yeah, way he changed more than my back. whole life. Shoot, that's more. That's, that's called a, a hundredfold. He changed my whole life, just like that, and in in overnight, overnight, literally, like whatever credit card debt I had, gone, gone in thirty <laughs> days. I was ordering the car. Look, by month four, I was ordering a, a GT AMG GT sixty three forty three. <laughs> Went from a car getting repossessed. <laughs> Yes. Now, before I got those the cars I was talking about, when I got a car back after the repossession, let me tell you about how God showed up. My father used to say, I, I went and tried to get something special finances. I know about all that. Yeah. I tried to get a cheaper car because my car that got repossessed was a Lexus. Try to get a Posada son with Volkswagen. They yeah. was talking about special finance. And I'm like, Lord, some kept just urging me, call Mercedes because I drove a Mercedes before the Lexus. And I talked sure to them. You don't start small, do you? N- but look, he didn't want me to because let me tell you, I talked to the people over the phone. I told them my situation. They was like, well, just fill out the application. So I was like, cool. So the man calls me up and was like, when you come and pick up your car? I was what? like, what? He was like, look, you ain't never was late with us. You ain't never paid us late. Mercedes, because I had a Lexus, but before the Lexus was the Mercedes. <laughs> he said, you ain't never paid us late when you come to get your car. You went up there and got a, a, I went a, a, brand, got a new brand new car off the boat with nine miles on it. And it was custom because somebody else ordered it and didn't want it. That's how <laughs> did God Did you have dude. a job at that point? I did have a job. So that's when yeah. you, so you was working at Chase? No, no. Chase was in Atlanta. Chase was just 2021. When I started working back in North Carolina before I came to Atlanta. Oh, before you came back. I was working for the Department of Social Services because I have an undergrad degree in social work. So I went right back to work. When I got my mind, when I accepted the fact that so this man- So you went man, there first and you was working in social work, yeah, driving a Mercedes. Yes. Which is unheard first, of. First car back. <laughs> first car back, brand new. 
It was like I got the job with the Department of Social Services. They hired me temp, and then they was like, oh, she she got the degree. We gonna per- give you know hire her permanently. I went and got the car probably like within the first month of working there. My daddy gave me the down payment, and it was on and popping. <laughs> She said, I'm back. <laughs> and it was just like that. And then I saved up my money for the nine months, I told you. And then I moved to Atlanta. And then that's when you was on, on. Yeah, that's when I started working on ministry, got with the bank, and just kept pouring into my platform, pouring into my platform. Worth the name. Tell people where ministry came from. Ministry, chemistry, but ministry meaning meeting the needs of the people. Because I knew that I, because community was built off the story I just told you. Mm-hmm. And I don't get to tell that story anymore because obviously my life has changed dramatically yeah. and there have been other experiences. But ministry meaning meeting the needs of the people and understanding that there are other women who have had similar experiences as I have. Yeah. And I wanted to create a platform where they could talk freely without being judged. And because my situation happened in the church, I could I didn't have anyone to go to. Normally we go to the church when we need support. Yeah. I didn't have that support. So I wanted to create a space for those people who needed the support and they could come. Nobody's going to hush you. Nobody's going to put you out. Nobody's going to judge you and tell you you're a bad person. We're going to talk about it until you arrive at a place of peace. That's what ministry was. By the time you came on the show, we had got Hollywood was on Fox Soul and turned it into all of this. You got Hollywood. <laughs> but we but we started out as an event. An event where we was just having these candid conversations. What made you go that route? Where you start? You said go in Hollywood because you still not on, you're not on Fox Old no more. I'm on in the Black Network now. Okay, yeah. So I always so I was not the face of Ministry. I was just a creator behind it. My oh. cousin who I talk about and another gentleman who was a relationship author, they were the face of it. Oh, you just produced it. I just produced it. But when I watched it, when they did it the very first time, I'm out in the audience. I saw a television show from the very first time. I knew it would be a television show. And I just kept pushing. <laughs> I love when our pain produces a platform. I love it. It's 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 ah, because like you said, out of that embarrassing situation, that heartbreaking situation, mm-hmm. you said, I can't be the only one. Yeah. And so you created a, an outlet, a platform from other people to be or be able to share what you wish was afforded to you mm-hmm. while you were going through it. And you yeah. said, listen, I want to create a safe space for other people uh, that's trying to get relationships right. They're trying mm-hmm. to figure this thing out. Um, and I, I, I applaud you for doing so. And so as you look back over that situation and you forgiven that young girl last year, did you feel a release? Did you feel something lift up off yes. of you? Yes. Like I finally... Because what, you know, because I'm in the word, I will always hear, you know, if God didn't give you that, then you just imagine what he has for you. And I never, you know, I never understood that statement because I thought that was the epitome. Yeah. You know, I didn't think it could get any better than that. And now that I'm out of it completely and I'm able to look back at it and I, I see how. I was just going to be living in, you know, I was trying to live vicariously through somebody else's gifts and not tapping into my own gifts. That's good. And God put me in a position to be able to execute on my own vision yeah, and my my gifts and not have to live, you know, in somebody else's shadow. Yeah. So I found contentment because I understood why. And I'm like, I'm not even in then for real, for real. We don't have anything in common. And when you really look back at that type of stuff, yeah. then that's what I'm saying. And when you get back or when you look back at that situation, are you so fully healed that if he, he and his wife got divorced, you mm-hmm. wouldn't be like, oh, oh, here's my chance. He's not like I told you, the attraction was to the anointing. So he ain't anointed. It no wasn't. More? No, he's still anointed. He's very much anointed. Yeah. But he's like, that's not my person. Good. You know what I'm saying? It's just not my person. Have you been through therapy since the, since all of this? I went not for that. I did have a relationship therapist some years ago. I didn't find it helpful. Why? Wow, I mean, we I, we talked about fundamental principles in terms of attachment styles and different things like that. Um, but aside from that, I didn't I didn't get anything. I'm not saying that I I shouldn't go now because uh, me and my partner we just had this conversation not long ago about therapy. You know, you and your partner. What partner? My business partner. Oh, okay. I <laughs> my said, business I said, partner. When you get somebody, we, you just said you ain't got nobody. No, no, no. My business partner. Okay. We just having candid conversations. Say business partner. Business, partner. business partner. You, you're blocking yourself when you yeah. say. I'm sorry, my, guys. Me and my partner. Me and my business partner. We were just having a candid conversation about 
relational things and we talked about therapy and I because of my experience I said I would have to vet someone out like really vet them out to you talking about you talking about the therapist or the yeah, person the therapist oh, okay you yeah. said you'll vet them no 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 you talking about a person to date that's definitely going to be like I'm in a whole different space now I've found like I said contentment in my own life I'm not looking for it because that was the problem I wasn't happy and this is another thing a lot of times you know you'll hear the term no do you love yourself and you instinctively say yes, yes I, I do, do. Yep. but no you don't yep. you can look at your decisions you can look at how you allow other people to treat you and tell whether you really love yourself teach you know, so I had to look back and the truth of the matter was I wasn't happy with my own life. There was something missing that I was searching for in someone else when in fact I found it in Jesus. But it took some time. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Now, since you've achieved a certain level financially, mm -hmm. does it make you more discriminative on how you date or based on the finances uh, or the income level and bracket of the guy? Does a guy have to make a certain amount of money for you to take no. him as a, a serious contender? No. I my I look for are you purposeful? Like you gotta be purposeful. You gotta be chasing that. You gotta be a visionary. You know, cause you're gonna get mad at me because I'm always creating. <laughs> you're gonna be like, you know, you're gonna get you're gonna get frustrated with me. So I want somebody who is secure in who they are and I want them to have a plan and what it is that you're trying to accomplish and achieve. Cause I don't need you trying to rain on my stuff. You know, if you just content where you are and you ain't trying to grow, then I'm probably not your person. Cause sure. I'm all I I'll create something, we'll put it out, and I'm on to the next thing. So you're saying that you don't care if he's making a lot of money, not mm -hmm. he can, you know, make an average salary. Yes. As long as he's in his purpose, yes. happy, thriving, helping to support you, mm -hmm. not raining in your parade, mm -hmm. then you good. Yep. That your money becomes his our money, money, our money. It's, it's all in one Because I ain't always had this money. I'm only three years in. You know? What so. has it changed? You feel like it changed a lot about you? Or if anything, what did it change? Because now you got options. You got choices. You you driving in cars that people looking like, how'd she get that? So it, it's a different world. I don't beat myself up anymore if somebody doesn't choose me. It's like, I know I'm good. If you don't like me, that's all you. <laughs> that's your problem. Did the money do that? I, I think it just, it gave me, it, it built my confidence and it's not the money, but just the options of being able to move more freely. Yeah. I mean, I just, I did more of what I wanted to do in terms of my purpose. And that's what gave me the confidence. So the money gave me the freedom, but it was me being able to operate in my purpose and do more of that. That gave me the confidence. So I know what I bring. So if you don't want me, that's just your problem. So that's just what it is. Chanel, 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 Chanel. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your transparency, your vulnerability. Do you have any projects coming up that we need to know about and we can support? Yes, I do have a new relationship game that What's comes it called? up. It's called well, it's, it's a two deck card game, and one deck is uh, dealing with healing journeys, navigating past pain and trauma, and the other one is exploring intimacy, uh, conversation starters for couples on sex and relationships. And the the healing journey, the navigating past pain and trauma is so that you and your partner can talk about some of those past yes. experiences. So if you're triggered, they can know how to support you. Good. You know, I, especially someone like me, you know, a lot of the stuff, I don't not talk about it because I'm trying to hide it. It's just it's in the past. Yeah. But there are certain things because I, I have dealt with a tremendous amount of rejection. If there is anything that I would call out on myself as a flaw it would be, I'm thinking, oh, they're not accepting me or they're rejecting me. So I created this card game so that we could create a space where we could talk about these things Good. freely, you know, Good. and have open conversation. Has it come out yet? It just came out. We just released it on Sunday. You say, y'all, so y'all releasing it Sunday? What day? This, no, it came out this past Sunday. Why you ain't got, why I got, you got one? I got you one out there. Well, we could have had it sitting on the, on oh the, on the set. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Brianna. Uh, can you want to dig in my the, the Gucci bag in there? Yeah. It's a purple box. Yeah, let me yeah. let me let me see that. Yeah, but yeah, and so um, so this will run in September sometime, and so mm -hmm. you have you have released it August. What's the date? It was released on August the twenty fifth. August the twenty fifth. Mm -hmm. 
Man, I'm just so proud of just you just being uh, a go getter. You know what I'm saying? Let's 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 get these cards right here. Yeah, yeah this right here. Relationships matter. And Rel- then the topic is on the other side. And that's just the, my sample box, but exploring really intimacy, box. conversation starts with couples mm-hmm. on sex and relationships, healing journey, navigating through past pain and trauma. Mm-hmm. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. And then that sex one, you know, people be getting hooked up because they find a person attractive and everything look good on paper, but then they can't fulfill each other in the bedroom. So that's just kind of built to... So so, so, so where'd that come from? Some stories you've heard about all that or what? No, because, you know, sometimes, like even myself, you know, you see somebody and you automatically think because of who they are, what they do, that that's a suitable partner for you. And then when you get you be, become intimate, you find that maybe you're not into what they into or they're not into what you went to. And then where, where does that leave us? And at 50 years old, I just don't have time to be finding out after the fact that either you can't please me or I can't please you. So yeah. we need to have that conversation first. You don't, you don't, you don't believe that, that even if you have the conversation, would you have the grace to work through it? It depends on what it is. If it's... Because uh... like a man... A man may be into certain things like, Say it. I don't know, like a woman may not be into oral sex. Okay. Well, a man needs to know that. 100%. Because if he likes that. Then we and ain't she, getting married. Exactly. If she ain't willing to try or practice or whatever, then like you say, we ain't getting married. No. But if y'all never have that conversation. Then y'all just, y'all, yeah. Y'all not meeting <laughs> each other expectations. <laughs> Shit, that's a pain point. Don't even start talking about that. <laughs> See that's with me I, I, we, we have con- Like me I'm gonna talk We are mm-hmm. gonna have conversations Straight up At the gate To understand what it is And not saying that We gotta participate In it now I'm right. saying that Hey What we going what, what do I have to Look forward to Amen Yes Because the reality <laughs> is Cause I wish I would've Asked this question And people have heard me Say this on my podcast Before mm-hmm. I didn't have The The knowledge When I was 28 years old And I got married Um to have the conversation, my ex-wife said, don't think our marriage is going to be based on sex. And I was like, of course it ain't going to be based on sex. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what that meant. Right. The question should have been, what do you feel like is a healthy um, uh, frequency? Mm-hmm. Because, like I said, we were having sex once every 10 days. I'm talking about as newlyweds. So I was like, this ain't this ain't right. Yeah. This ain't going... This, this, <laughs> this, this is torture. I feel like God was punishing me for 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 having premarital sex because I said if I had nothing to compare it to, would once every ten days be okay to, with me? Right. You know, so I'm over here doing wow. this, and then uh, you know, as I've been transparent about that, it was the first time I ever masturbated in my entire life was when I got married. Wow. I said I was going to write a book back then called "I Started Masturbating Once I Got Married." I still should write that book. That'd be a powerful book. Yeah. But but how we don't talk about that's a good book. I'm gonna write that book <laughs> because it's gonna talk about how we don't talk about. Right. stuff leading into it that we talk about being equally yoked but we don't mm-hmm. talk about being sexually yoked right. and if you have somebody and, and and especially when you find that one in five women has have been victims of sexual assault mm-hmm. and now they even say one in three mm-hmm. well the reality when it's African American women to unpack that and say now what does this look like mm-hmm. because I don't want to be a part of your trigger your right. trauma let's talk about it and so that we can establish what healthy touching is yes. and what healthy aggression is where it's not like you're forcing your wife to do this but you're getting her permission and Mm -hmm. all that stuff just trying to cultivate that to be a healthy environment and so yeah um i think that'll be a powerful thing it's interesting that you did these cards because since 2020 uh people on my podcast and why don't you do some dating cards why don't you do some dating cards like i said yeah i'm gonna do one i'm gonna do one and life hasn't Mm -hmm. happened and so i'm gonna do that so what we're gonna do is support your cards like crazy Mm -hmm. until my cards come out this is gonna be the seed that that we're gonna get all my uh followers that support this podcast how can they get it go to your website yes relationshipsmatterlive.com relationshipsmatterlive.com pick up the cards do we get can we get a special promo can we get a, 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 a wifey discount code? Of course. Okay. We're going to have a wifey discount code. I ain't going to put it on the spot and find out what that code is just yet. But you're going to put code wifey and you're going to get a special discount. Yep. So code wifey. Good. That's the code. Yeah. Code wifey. But I'm talking about the percentage. Okay. The percentage. Yeah, okay. We, we'll let you go talk to <laughs> you and the powers that be. Uh, but uh, code wifey for a special discount. Listen, uh, 
Chanel, yes. I appreciate this. I'm glad that you are vulnerable and transparent, like you always are. Uh, and um, oh, before we wrap up, I do want you to touch on this. Mm -hmm. You talked about how age. That when you turn fifty, mm -hmm. you didn't touch on this at the very beginning. But when you took fit, when you turned fifty, you felt like talking to certain guys. It begins to be a deterrent by your age. Um, you kept saying that you'll see people because like they'll think that you're younger than what you yes. are, but fifty. It, uh, touch on that real quick for the yeah, women the, that can identify. The energy shifts. Like a guy could be attracted to you. I told you the story about this gentleman who invited me to his birthday party and I knew that he had a wife so I found it weird that he reached out me reached out to me specifically and was like hey come join my birthday so I'm like but I'm gonna go because he invited me and he had done a um I had ministry at an expo and him and his wife participated on it so I'm like okay cool I invited him out he came he invited me I'm gonna go to the party I go to the party and he comes up and the first thing he tells me is that him and his wife are divorcing so I'm like, what? Because it was like a less than a year later. And it was his 40th birthday. And I was 49, about to be 50 at the time. And so I noticed that he was showing me special attention, making sure I had a seat and, you know, just how men do. And we began talking and he said, so Chanel, how old are you? And I said, he said, I, I didn't say it first. I said, how old do you think I am? He said, 40. I said, add 10 to that. I'll be that in a couple months. And when I tell you, it was like, he was like, it was almost like, okay, then well. And then he goes, <laughs> and started talking. And I said, does that, and I said, does that bother you? He was like, oh no, age is but a number. But I saw it in his body language. I read the body language. And I ain't heard from that guy <laughs> no more. <laughs> he said, age ain't nothing but a number, but hey, yes. I'm going to need that number to be younger than that. <laughs> that's, that's what he yes. said. Yes. So, and I like younger men. So, I had no problem with him being 40. Yeah, you, you just know? don't like, you, you discriminate against older men. See, that's your problem. Cause like do, do they even know how to still but, but coming up I guess they even know how to still dress And look nice And do they You know uh, So you tell me You don't see nobody 50, 52, 53 There are no some address. rare There are some rare ones She's, And maybe that's what You can do to help them See, Laterris, you forget that I'm 50, never married, never married, no children, eight years of celibacy, another four. I ain't got time to be teaching nobody. Yes, you do. Nothing. Because he got he got time to teach you. <laughs> so he the gonna reality, teach me? he going to teach you something about you ain't never been in a long-term relationship like that. Then I think about... In 10 years, 10 years is a long time because I remember my 40th birthday and it seemed like it was forever ago. So I do realize, but I'm like, in 10 years, I'll be 60. That's scary to me. And it's only scary because I feel like I haven't lived my life full yet. I haven't lived fully. So this is what I want to do to encourage you. Okay. Shake all that mess off. Shake all these boundaries off of what you think because everything you keep saying is trauma-based. You're saying... And if he's 50 and his penis don't work, oh. if he's 50, he'll not address. If he's 50 and he's this, you 50, he could say the same thing. That same prejudice that the 40-year-old guy, or however old he was, yeah. he, he that's what, when you saw his spirit leave his body, that's what he <laughs> thought when you said you was about to be 50. He made an ass assumption, a deduction, and whatever it was, you never heard from it again. Yes. And so in that same sense, is don't, Create that same bias when you don't want somebody to do the same for you. Mm -hmm. Allow it to take place. Allow whatever your greatest fear to be. Challenge it. He may be 57 years old, but he's vibrant. He's cool. He's fun. And you're like, wow, I never thought this. 57? <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> Chanel, at this point, you weren't supposed to speak. You're supposed to listen. Oh, you're supposed, sorry. To, supposed to listen to me encourage you. I'm trying to encourage you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Are you crazy? Because <laughs> you're so stuck on these younger dudes that you can't even open your mind up to somebody. Because you're going to be 60 in three years. And you're going to be 60 I'll in 10. I'll do 51. 51. I, I can, you know, I could do that. I could do 51. I just know that I just got too much life to live to be held down. I just, 
See, see that? Why you think he'll hold you down? I don't know, cause he ain't gonna be want to do what I want to do. Is well, he gonna, you, is he gonna still want to get on a roller coaster at sixty? Could he probably gonna have a heart attack? <laughs> <laughs> Why you act like sixty is eighty nine? <sighs> you know that's when your face started to change. <laughs> <laughs> it really start happening in your fifties. Listen, I had, but, I had Gary Chapman on my podcast. He's eighty six years old. Mm-hmm. Now there's some real ones out there. I'm not saying there ain't no one. I've seen some attractive. And he's walking years. around, vibrant. People saying, "God, he looks really good for eighty something." I thought he was. I thought he was way younger, like late or early seventies or something. Yeah. So, so if I can just, if somebody can look. 10 years younger than them then does it really matter that they're 57 if it they doesn't feel matter they... I, it doesn't matter I just because I missed out on life those first 8 years and then the, I just want to I want to experience some of that youthfulness and that's what you can experience when the love is youthful okay so you keep judging youthfulness that was powerful y'all right there wasn't it that was nice <laughs> You think the person you're basing it on the person when love is youthful. When you when you fall in love with somebody that accepts you for who you are yes. and you accept them for who they are, naked and unashamed, mm-hmm. meaning that this is who I am. This is my full uh, essence, my vulnerability, my idiosyncrasies, my good, my bad, my successes, my failures. This is who I am. You say, and I still choose you. And he still chooses you. Then at the end of the day, y'all are going to have a youthful love. Y'all can go and then you can show different. He may be a guy that is stuck in in in, in, um, in corporate America and don't get a chance to have that much fun, mm-hmm. but you may be that person to do yeah. that. And you're like, man, let's go on trips. Let's go do this And you become that person That brings that joy Now you're asking me In general But if I meet someone Who's 50 whatever And he's attractive Yeah And all the other It all changes And everything else lines up Everything It it will change I will give him an opportunity And that's all I said Listen Y'all give it up For my homie Chanel Scott And we just did our Therapy session (laughs) Y'all be blessed Stay tuned to the end For a letter to my future wifey In writing these love letters To you Ladarian thrusted suddenly into child protective services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? Joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, Our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. 
We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse, I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTaris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. First of all, I just like to thank Chanel Scott for her transparency and vulnerability. I love it when I get guests on the podcast that are unadulterated, honest, or unadulteratedly honest. Whatever. But I love that she's very transparent, honest, and vulnerable. Well, here's my favorite part of the podcast where I speak to my future wifey. Dear future wifey, when I look into your eyes, I will see the reflection of a love that needs no explanation. A connection that is felt deep within, resonating in every heartbeat. There will be no second guessing, no hesitation, just the pure, unfiltered truth of who we are to each other. Our souls will speak the same unspoken language where words are not needed to affirm what our hearts already know. Together, we will stand side by side, hearts aligned with no doubts, no fears, only the beautiful certainty that you are mine and I am yours forever. We will not stumble in the dark, questioning where we stand for every step we take will be guided by the undeniable truth of our bond, our love, like the morning sun will rise with purpose, clear and bright, casting away all shadows of doubt. There will be no confusion, no gray areas, only the brilliant colors of a love that is certain, a love that is us. Your future hubby. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.